But today I want to talk about God as our sovereign sanctuary. In all the turmoil, all the things that happen, God is still in control. This virus, these things that are occurring are not a surprise to God. God has allowed this thing to take place. And I know it seems strange to us, but He is working His will even through the bad things that happen. And so I want to share with you a comforting verse that when all this turmoil is going on, there's this temptation for us to focus on the turmoil that's going on around us and to take our eyes off of the Lord. So I want to read Psalm 46 for you and then we're going to break it down today. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage, and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the, sp he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. When we think of these scriptures, we see even in these scriptures a great deal of turmoil that is going on. We see how, you know, we see at the beginning, it, it starts us off, it kind of tries to focus us in the middle of it. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. You have a picture here of the world falling apart, or the world going into turmoil. And... What do we do when the world falls apart? This psalm is preaching to us an important truth. It's a preaching to us to remember that God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our very present help in trouble. Look at that first part there. God is our refuge. God is like a fortress that we can run into and be safe. When all the world and all the chaos is going on, we can run to God. We can find our security and our safety in Him. The other thing is we see that God is our strength. You know, we have all these things that we still have to do in the midst of this. We still have to go out and, and get food. We still have to take care of certain aspects of daily life. And there's a certain anxiety now in the air, especially if you have to go near anywhere public. There's this kind of tension like... All right, is, is the thing here? And, and we have this anxiety, and it can be exhausting. I don't know about you, but I know, even myself, just all the things I had to do to adjust to this, you feel it. You feel it wearying on your body. And we have to be reminded that the Lord is our strength. He's the one that's going to give us the power to keep moving forward. The temptation is for us to take our eyes off of Him and get wrapped up in all of these things when we need to stay laser focused on the Lord because He is our strength. The other thing we need to see is that He is a very present help in trouble. God is our help. And God is the one who will be able to get us through this. But He's not just our help. He's our very present help. In every moment that we go through, God is there with us. He's not distant. He's not just up and far away from us. We have the Holy Spirit. He is with us in each and every moment that we go through. He's there and He is able to help us. But often we forget to ask for help. We need to run to Him as our help. The other important thing is when we look at verses 2 through 3, 
it says right here, it says, Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth gives way, the mountains tremble, and the sea roars. Therefore, we will not fear. Why? Therefore is pointing to what came right before it. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is the one who is our very present help in the midst of all of this trouble. This is the idea that when the whole world is falling apart, we may be watching mountains just crash. It's like one of those end of the world movies where you see everything just blowing up and falling to pieces and the ocean is just in utter turmoil and chaos. When we see that, we can look at those situations without being ruled by fear because we know that in the midst of these mountains that are crashing into the ocean and all of this turmoil, our God is the one who made those mountains. Our God is the one who has allowed creation to do these things. Our God is the one who has made the virus. God is in control, even when it is inconceivable. Ultimately, all these things that exist and be, exist and be because of his power. And he allows things to take place. And sometimes doing, doing work and doing things that we can't fathom or understand. But scripture is littered, especially through the Old Testament, where we see turmoil and chaotic things, things that make you just give up hope. Yet how did they have hope in the midst of that? God was their refuge. God was their strength. They knew that no matter what is happening right now at this moment, God is in control. And He is my God. He is my refuge, my hope, in whom I have a relationship with. He is my helper when I need it. That's who's running this thing. That's why they can say, what the psalmist can say, Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. We will not fear. Because the one who's watching all of this, allowing all of it to unfold, is the God who is in control. That's our God. That's why we don't have to fear. We can trust him, even when it is chaos. The next thing I want us to know is that God gives life and protects his people. Look with me in verses 4 through 7. See, the psalm is separated by these little selahs, and they're kind of breaking it up into different pieces. This next part that's been broken up is verses 4 through 7. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst. He's in the middle of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Here's the thing. The psalm starts out in verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now here's the interesting thing. It talks about this river, and this river is mentioned in other parts of Scripture. In the beginning in Genesis, there was a river through the Garden of Eden. And a second, we're going to see in Revelation that same river restored. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel is a prophet that kind of came after the, after the exile. Ezekiel was prophesying to God's people after the second temple had been destroyed. Now, there was a temple, actually after the first temple had been destroyed, Ezekiel saw a third temple that God was going to build. But this temple didn't match the normal schematics of a regular temple. This temple was much larger. It was much more dramatic in its scale. Almost unbelievable. And the idea here is that the temple is the dwelling place where God would meet with his people. So notice again, we look at verse 4 in this psalm. It says, 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation, dwelling place of the Most High. The idea is, is that for them, having the temple there meant that God's presence was there with them, dwelling with them. So when we go to Ezekiel, and go to Ezekiel chapter 46, in verses 1 through 12, actually it's chapter 47, I'm sorry, but we see verses 1 through 12 talk about a river that's coming out of this temple. And when you look at verse 9, it describes this river. This river is like flowing out from underneath the base of the temple, and it flows out towards the sea. But this is the description of this river. It says, wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea, from the Engedi to the Englaim, and it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be like very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh, they are left for salt. But then look at verse 12. It says, And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, their fruit will not fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. Here's the idea. This river, whatever this river touches, it brings life. Where's the river coming from? The temple. What is the temple? A place where the presence of God dwells with his people. There is a river of life coming from God to his people who have a relationship, who are in the presence of God. There flows this life-giving river. Didn't Jesus talk about this? Do you remember the woman in the well in John 4? When he told her, he said, if you knew who is asking you for water, you would ask him for water. And he would give you water and you would never thirst again. Jesus talks about this. And then later in John 7, verses 37 through 39, he is up by, amazingly, he's in Jerusalem by the temple of that day. The temple that would later get torn down. And Je Jesus makes his statement in John seven thirty seven. It says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus makes a statement here. He says, are you thirsty? Is your soul longing to be filled with the river of life, the water of life? And it says in verse 38, it says, Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then verse 39 explains that he was talking about having the Holy Spirit. What do we get when we believe in Christ and surrender to him as our Lord and Savior? We get the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? God. He's, the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. He is God. We get God dwelling with us, inside of us. Just like God was in the temple and the people would go to meet with God in the temple. We have now become the temple of the Lord. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 3. You can see that in Ephesians 1. But Jesus here calls the Holy Spirit. He references it and says, Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he's referencing the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. No matter what we're going through, no matter what turmoil we are facing, to be in the presence of God, to have God's presence in our life, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the living water of life in us. No matter what turmoil comes. So when you read Psalm 46.4, it says, 
There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. When you read that, that's us. Romans 11 makes clear that we are grafted in to the people of God through Jesus Christ. So this verse that applies to Old Testament Israel applies to us. But then when we look at Revelation 22, 1-5, no matter what comes, there is coming a day where I won't just have the Holy Spirit inside of me. I will be in glory with God when He has made all things new, when He has made everything right. And look how it is described. Revelations chapter 22, verses 1-5. through 5. It says, And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for healing for the nations. No longer will it be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. There will be no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The beauty of our future, the beauty of the fact that we have the river of life, is we also have a promise. Ephesians 1 says the Holy Spirit is our promise of our inheritance in God. And no matter what happens with this virus, if this virus takes me home, I will be in glory with God. Eating of the tree of life, basking in the Lord as my light, with the river of life flowing through the garden. This is the beautiful picture of God's promise and his salvation. The other thing I want us to know back in Psalms 46 is verse 5. It says here, not only do we have a river of life that makes glad the city of God, that brings us joy in the midst of our trial. Verse 5 says, God is in the midst of her. God is in the middle of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. You may see the enemy gathering at the gates. We may see this plague that we, the enemy, we can't see. But we can know that God is in the midst of us. And God's word says, we shall not be moved. He will help her when morning comes. You know, there's sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. We may have a rough season, but we can count on God to be our defense, to be our rock, no matter what happens. When you think about this verse, God tells, in the in prophet Isaiah, and you can go ahead and turn there, in chapter 41, verses 8 through 13, you know, God sent Isaiah, as he does pretty much all the prophets in the Old Testament, to warn God's people. Sometimes, maybe like 20% of the time, they speak an encouraging word that, hey, you've done something right. But a lot of times, God sends a prophet when there's something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be addressed. God sends Isaiah and later Jeremiah and all these prophets to warn Israel that, hey, you better repent, you better turn from this stuff or judgment is coming. And the thing is, is that even in the midst of all those warnings that they need to repent, there's still this promise for God's people. In Isaiah 41, 8 through 13, this is what God says to Israel and Jacob. He says, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant, I have chosen you, and I have not thrown you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive and fight against you, they shall be as nothing and they shall perish. 
You shall seek those who fought with you, but you will not find them. Those who war against you shall be as if they were nothing at all. But then he says this in verse 13. He says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not. I am the one who helps you. God will defend us. God will protect us because we are His. I'm not saying that we won't have turmoil. I'm not saying we won't have difficulty or challenges. God's speaking that verse to a nation that He is about to discipline, and they are going to get disciplined severely. However, God is still God. God is still going to keep His ultimate promise to them. Salvation is not lost for those who are truly believers in Him, who are truly in Christ. Even in the darkest days, God's promise stays. Fear not, for I am the one who helps you. Even if God is the one, even if God is the one who disciplines you, He's also the one who helps you. And even in the midst of this situation, whatever the reason for this turmoil that we are going through, and I believe, just as God did with 9-11 for a season, just as God did through many different trials, isn't it amazing that God has used so many tragic events or difficult events to turn people back to Him? God's ultimate promise does not fail. If you are in Christ, this promise is for you. He says, For I, the Lord, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. That's comfort. That helps us have peace in the midst of turmoil. Because we have to remember the God that helps us is stronger than whatever we're facing. Look at verses 6 through 7. There's this image of at total upheaval among nations. Verses 6 through 7, it says, The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, and God utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Here's what the scripture is saying. Nations rage. Kingdoms totter. Nations rage. This idea of nations rising up to fight, rising up to war. There's fear that there's going to be this massive conflict. And as nations go to war, you see kingdoms and nations around you falling and tottering. And there's civil unrest and everything is broken. And there are these big, scary armies tearing up and conquering other lands. But then in the middle of it, we get this image of God. And it says, he utters his voice and the earth melts. Here's the point. No matter what the trial, no matter what the turmoil, God is all-powerful, almighty God. No matter what happens, God can end it in an instant. God can speak and bring it to nothing. He can speak and the earth melts. Whom shall I fear if the Lord is with me? The only person that we need to fear and reverence is God. Or to quote my father, <laughs> Dad, Mom, if you're listening, he said, there are only two things I fear. That's the Lord and your mother. And I thought that was a great quote. I'll never forget that. But here's the truth of it. I don't need to be afraid of turmoil and things that come. Should I be wise? Yes. God gave you a natural fear of fire so you don't just touch it or jump around in it. There's a purpose to the warning systems that God has given us. But being consumed by fear is not my place as a Christian. I can rest in Christ. I can rest in in God. It says in verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And all this turmoil is going on, all this upheaval in nations, God is our fortress. God is the rock that we can run into and hide. And it says the Lord of hosts. Anytime you hear the Lord of hosts, host is talking about a massive amount of people. That's what a host is. And it's kind of referencing the angelic host or the God of a great big host, a great big army. This is the idea that a God of a great big massive army 
that my God and his army is bigger than any obstacle and any challenge that I face. That's what you should picture when you hear the Lord of hosts. It's talking about God's might. We serve a mighty and all-powerful God, and he is our rock, and he is our fortress. The last thing we need to know in the midst of this turmoil is that God is working out his plan. Now, the verse, one of the verses we're about to read, Be still and know that I am God, it kind of gets quoted out of context sometimes. Sometimes I say, it, like it's just a basic command for me, the reader, just be still and know that I am God. While it's good to stop and reflect and know that God is God, there's, there's more to this when we look at this in context. God is working and carrying out his plan. I want you to see this when we look in these scriptures. And so when you next time you're still and know that he's God, think about it in light of the fact that his control, his sovereignty over all creation. Look at verses 8 through 9. It says, Come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. Desolation is like utter destruction, utter ruin. It says, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now here's what's amazing when you read this verse. It almost, I'm not going to say that it's prophecy, but it almost feels prophetic. When you look in light of what other prophets say is going to happen in the end times. Because you see this in verse 8, this great big desolation. It says, come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. We know in the end times in Revelation that it is going to get bad. There's going to be turmoil and devastation. All these things occur. But right after that, look at this. It says in verse 9, it says, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, a weapon of war and a symbol of power. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. He's going to make all the wars cease. And to all those armies that are raging and fighting, this be still and know that I'm God, this is in the plural tense. It's not just saying it to the reader. God is speaking to the nations of the earth that are fighting and warring. So God just got done breaking every bow and spear and burning the chariots with fire, he just breaks all of that up and he says, stop, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among all of you, the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There's a picture of the desolations that God has wrought, a picture of God breaking down and destroying all the weapons of war and telling everybody to be still. And know that he is God. And he says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. All of this turmoil going on around us. All of the things that we see. I remember there was a Johnny Cash song. And the music video is kind of grim. Don't watch it with little kids. But it talks, it, 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 in the song it talks about there will be wars. There will be famine. There will be pestilence. There will be turmoils. But the Johnny Cash song, he says, he says, he, he talks about how the prophets wrote about it. Jesus spoke about it. He said, don't worry, it's going by the book. And he's mainly referring to the book of Revelation. But the point that Johnny Cash knows and that even the psalmist here knows is that there is going to be turmoil. There is going to be trouble in this world. But God is working out his plan in the midst of all of it. God's works are awesome and fearsome in their scale. Look at verse 8. He says, Come and behold the works of the Lord. He has brought desolations on the earth. You only need to look at a hurricane and its effects to see only a tiny glimpse of God's power on display in nature. And even that hurricane 
pales so dramatically in comparison to the winds and the wind speed on other planets in our solar system that like their average wind speed is like somewhere between four and seven hundred miles an hour. And even then, even bigger, the stars, the rays, our sun of which is just a small tiny star compared to much bigger stars that are out there in the galaxy. Stars that you could fit thousands of our suns inside of. And the idea is, is that there is an intensity of power, and even some of the stars, a star that big, bigger than our solar system, just blowing up and releasing a shock wave that you could not imagine. Collisions so great in the universe that two black holes colliding, they collide so hard that the gravity that they generate they cause literal ripples and vibrations in space and time itself. I know it sounds crazy, but this is science. This is theory of relativity. Space and time itself literally ripples. Space and time rippling and shaking. They just discovered this a few years ago. The point is, is that it's so much collision that it can be light years away and that this collision, the shock waves from it, literally shake space and time itself. And God is more powerful than that. So it says, Come behold the works of the Lord. He has brought desolations on the earth. God is mighty and powerful. When Job was suffering and he told God, You know, if God, if you were here, I would, I would tell you what I think. And God shows up and says, Okay, tell me what you think. And in the midst of all of that, God starts asking Job a lot of questions. And God asked Job about this creature, this sea monster called Leviathan. We don't know exactly what it is. Uh, people try and guess what it is. Some people think it's a dinosaur or all these other things. But nobody really knows. All we know is that Leviathan is this great and monstrous sea creature. And that every time they have tried to tame it, every time they have tried to control it, they can't. It's fierce. And captains on their boats on the sea were afraid of it. And it was such a mighty force to them that when God describes it and asks Job, Hey Job, can you handle that? Do you know how to tame it? Can you control these big, massive, awesome forces that are going on around you, Job? Like I can. And Job, when he realizes that not only is God all wise and all knowing, but God is all powerful and he is working on a scale of force and intensity that Job can't even handle. Job responds. He says in chapter 42, verse 2, he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That was me asking stupid questions. He says, therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I hear and I will speak and I will question you and you make it known to me. I have heard you now by the hearing of my ears and I have now seen you with my eyes. Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job in the midst of his suffering after he really hears and sees the scale in which God is working, it humbles him to realize that he, he is living in the presence of a holy and all powerful God. A God who works with intensity. But the thing I want us to see is that God's ultimate plan will be accomplished. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots of fire. And then he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Long before we get to Revelation, there's a reference to this in Isaiah, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Listen to what Isaiah describes about the day of the Lord. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, he says in verse 2, it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills. And all the nations shall flow to it. What did Jesus say in the New Testament? When I am lifted up, 
I will draw all men unto myself. The mountain, the dwelling place of God, lift it up, drawing all the nations to it. And listen to what else it says. It says, And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the law is no longer going to be just exclusive Jerusalem. It's going to go out to all the nations. And it says in verse 4, it says, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isaiah, a book warning them that God's later going to judge Jerusalem, tells them there's coming a day where God will lift up his dwelling place and draw all men unto himself. And these nations that were at war will beat their weapons into plowshares so they can farm. This is the idea. And at the end of it in verse 5 of Isaiah 2, it says, O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. What I want you to realize when we see Psalm 46 when we behold, in verse 8, the desolations of the Lord that he's done on the earth, know that even in that, just like in Revelation, that turmoil comes. But then we see God making war cease to the ends of the earth, breaking the bow, shattering the spear, burning the chariots with fire. And he says to all these warring nations, as he carries out his will, this is the end result. This is where it's all going to wind up in the end. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted, lifted up among the nations. I will be exalted and lifted up in the earth. And then lastly, the psalm concludes, for us to rest in God as our fortress. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I want you to think in light of these truths. I want us to think about the fact that God is our shelter. When all the world falls apart, we have God as our rock. God gives us life and protects us because we are his people. We have the Holy Spirit. We have access to the river of life. Let us dwell in him. Let us rest in him and be renewed. We don't have to be afraid of the turmoil that's going on outside. God will protect us. God is working out his plan. Revelation, Jesus, prophets of old are very clear that it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Don't let anybody lie to you. And try and convince you that the fact that things are getting worse and getting difficult are a sign that God is not there. God is working out his will. Not a single crazy thing that is happening goes against what God has said in his word. He said there would be turmoil. He said there would be difficulty. But he also said that he would be our rock and our hope. So I encourage you today, if you're a believer, rest in the rock. When turmoil comes and the ground around you is shaking, you rest in the one who is sovereign and in control. On your very worst day, you're going to be in glory. God is with us. He is our helper and our rock. If you're visiting today, if you're watching this stream for the first time, or maybe you've been watching it for a few times, I want you to know that I have a hope that's available for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that God is a just judge that must punish sin, but he is also a loving God that wants to save us. Sin separates us from this holy and just God. And the only way that we can have a relationship with him is through Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that he died for our sin, 
on the cross. And he got that justice, that punishment that we deserve for our sin. So that we don't have to be separated from God and hell and all those awful things. That we can have redemption through God. We've all sinned. Everybody's failed. None of us are good enough. Even if you've done a lot of good things, the bad things we've done still have to be judged. The only way we can be saved through them is what Jesus did for us on the cross. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not die, but have eternal life. That blessed assurance, that promise that we talked about today, having God dwelling, living in us, and knowing we're going to heaven when we die, that's why God sent Jesus, was to save us from our sin, so we could have a relationship in the presence of God in our lives through Jesus Christ. How do we get it? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If we surrender to Jesus as our Lord, as our King, and we believe that he really died on the cross and was buried and really rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death, and the Bible says we will be saved. If we surrender to Jesus. That's what real repentance is. It's not just saying, hey God, I won't do it again. It's saying, hey God, I'm tired of living life my way. My life is sinful and broken. Will you be the king of my life? That's what it really means to repent. You're giving over your life to him. And when you do that, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And you have the presence of God, that river of life. And you don't have to worry about thirsting spiritually anymore. You can be fed. You can have true life in Jesus Christ. And you can have a hope when it seems like the entire world is falling apart. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I pray that if, if God puts it on your heart to give your life to Him while I'm praying, I encourage you, if only if you mean it, to pray and surrender your life to God and just tell him, be like, will you please be the Lord and Savior of my life? I believe you really died on the cross for me. I believe you can save me. Will you please save me and change me? Here's my life. Take it. Be my king. So when I'm praying, I encourage you, if the Lord's put down a heart for you to do that, um, that you will take this time and you just don't listen to what I'm saying. Just have a conversation with God and surrender your life to him. If you still have questions, you're not sure if you're ready to do that, please reach out to us on Facebook Messenger or call the church or, um, or mail, email, whatever uh, you want to do. Because I'd love to talk to you about it. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, God, thank you. God, that you are the one who made this earth and this creation. And God, there are so many beautiful things that you have made. God, life itself is a blessing and a gift from you. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, in these challenging times, God, when there is fear, when there is anxiety, will you help us to rest in you as our rock and our hope? And God, help us to have the big picture in mind, Lord. God, that you are at work. That even in all these turmoils and things, God, you are doing a work softening people's hearts into salvation. God, you are doing a work among the nations and in the world. Bring us closer to the day, Lord Jesus. God, when you will come again and you will make all things right. God, please, Lord Jesus, prepare some more souls for that day. And help us, God, to make the most of our limited time on this earth. Because the days are evil and they're short. Help us, God, to not waste the gift of life that you have given us. Help us to be bold for the gospel in this season. And please bring people to salvation. We love you, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that God will continue to bless you. Like I said, check up on your church family members. Um, and, you know, if God puts them on your mind, call them. See how they're doing. If you want to send in and, and say hey to everybody else, uh, you want to send in a little letter or anything like that, uh, contact us and and give that to us. We'd love to, for the church body to be able to see each other. Um, not everybody has Facebook, so that would be good. Um, 
So God bless you. I pray that he will be your strength and he will be your rock this week. And if you're a believer, will you be bold to share the gospel of Christ with your family and friends as you talk to them? God bless. Have a great day.